New week on the Just Baseball Show, Monday, August 8th. Jack McFarlane, Aram Layton. We're going to bounce around a lot of the headlines from this weekend. We're going to talk about a, a couple of teams that were very noisy at the trade deadline and have been noisy all year long that got swept over the weekend. Um, we're going to talk about some notable transactions, uh, a designated for assignment that we got to go over, an option that we have to go over. Uh, I do want to talk about one certain rookie of the year front runners comments after facing adversity. Uh, and then uh, we'll bounce around to some other stuff. Um, I know a, a certain someone has started a rehab assignment as well. We're going to check off a whole bunch of headlines, but Aram, how was Peyton Burdick's first MLB hit, man? Hey, I, I'm really happy for him. Um, it was, it was cool. I, I got the, uh, and this is what the Cape is all about too. Right. So um my my host family sent me a text, Michael and Barbara. They're just over the moon, uh, you know that that Burdick was able to to get that first hit and then the first home run as well. Um, and and I could just sense their excitement. I could sense you know Peyton's family's excitement. It's it's pretty freaking awesome uh, to have seen that. And uh, he's look he looks great so far. He looks really awesome. And uh, that's probably one of the cooler, more underrated things about the the Cape Cod League man is that. If you if it all goes right, it, you know there's always, of course, unfortunate you know, setups and pairings with players, and but most of the time it goes well with players and families, and uh, you almost have a second family that's always rooting for you, always pulling for you, and yep. and will like follow you until your baseball career is over, and that's exactly what my host family, Michael and Barbara, do, do with all of their players, and uh, Peyton Burdick's one of them, and and he's uh, got a pretty awesome story because, like you said, you, I think we mentioned it on the show. <laughs> He, he was on a temp contract, right? The year you were out there and he hit three bombs. Yeah. In one of so the early games of the season. It was, um, I, I think I have told this, but I'll, I'll tell it again. It's a quick story. My, this was the first game that I had ever truly called. Like I had only <laughs> been practicing, you know, like I had only been practicing into, into voice memos no, on my iPhone. I like had the same the shit. Row. I was, I was so bad the first game too. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, this was the first game I was panicked out of my mind. This was the first time I was gonna, ever going to do more than like two innings at a time, because I would just go sit in the top row, hop on voice memos and do that. And like, that's what I sent in to get that job on the Cape. Yep, so same. first time for me and my partner, Tim Leonard, we're shitting our pants. We're like, I'm so nervous right now. Like, we're about to call a baseball game. We think the equipment's set up correctly. And then we've got this guy that's on a temp contract. He's only supposed to be there for like three, four days before one of the permanent players comes. And he has a three homer game on the first day of the Cape Cod League in 2018. So naturally, they sign him for the rest of the year. He impresses the rest of the year. Marlins take him out of right state. And now Peyton Burdick has a hit and a bomb in Major League Baseball. Things snowball in a good way for yeah. people that show up in the Cape Cod League. A hundred percent. You could really, and it, it sounds crazy that I didn't even like say this before, but you can really point to that as like the first domino that really put Peyton Burdick over the it top. Is. He would have been drafted. He would have absolutely been drafted in some not, capacity. because Not numbers, as high. Not nearly, nearly as high um, as a right state guy. So that's, what's really cool about the Cape is it gives guys opportunities to, to really solidify, you know, who they are and, and solidify that draft stock and prove it against, uh, you know, top level talent. So I hope he keeps rolling. Uh, I'm glad the Marlins are rolling out some younger guys there. And, um, you know, it was, it was fun to watch them get carved by anybody with a left arm, uh, but we're not here to talk about them. So where do you want to start? Um, I think I want to start with Ian Anderson. Because that was, in my opinion, one of the biggest stories of the weekend. I understand that a couple teams got swept, but we are, I feel like we naturally skew player centric as opposed to team centric. Um, so we're going to focus on individual accolades, individual successes and failures. Um, and, and this was really tough for Ian Anderson. And, you know, he's only 23, 24 years old. Um, this he is what he's just his turned 24. Just turned 24. It feels like he's been in the bigs for 10 years because of how many high leverage postseason starts he's made and succeeded with flying colors. Yep. Ian Anderson, postseason ace Ian Anderson, was having a terrible season to the point where the Braves had no choice but to option him. Ian Anderson getting optioned can be gutting for him. I hope it's not. I hope he... I hope this is a fire lit in him. He goes down and figures something out. But I that is one of those where that was the last thing that Atlanta wanted to do, yeah. I'm sure. 
but they had to do it because he just was not succeeding. Yeah, it's it's really tough because it's one of those situations where you you hit the ground running so well in the early parts of your career that you almost set the bar so high for yourself. And he's a guy that he, he's you know what you're getting with him, right? It's going to be a really tough to pick up change up a fastball. That he'll sneak by you because the change up is so effective. And then, you know, an average curve that he'll mix in there. What he really his M.O. is the fastball change up. You can't differentiate the two from his release point. They're both low spin and it's it's tough to read. Here's the thing, though. League adjusts to you, right? And this is a guy that is fastball. If you're if you're on it, it's not that great. Um, and the changeup is the one pitch you're really afraid of. You're looking down in the zone almost, right? Everything is going to be in the lower third of the zone. And I think that seemed to be what how the league adjusted to him to a degree. He had to be so perfect. And if he left it slightly up, you know, if it was closer to the top part of that low third of the zone, it's getting crushed. And he was so good in the beginning because the league didn't totally adjust to him yet. And, and now we, we've seen that adjustment. I think what he really needs is that breaking ball to be better than just a, you know, mix in show me pitch. Yes. Uh, otherwise guys are going to be able to really just sit on that change up or, or and dare, him, dare them to beat him with the, or dare him to beat them with the fastball. So look, I, I, I'm not going to really sound the alarms to the degree of like, this guy is, is doomed, right? He got sent down. What's happening. He just turned 24. We've seen that the fastball changeup can work at the highest of levels in the highest of leverage situations, but you can't be a two pitch guy unless it's fastball slider. And the fastball has 20 inches of induced vertical break, like Spencer Strider uh, and Christian Javier and the slider is plus that's the only way because you can fall back on a slider that gets zone with. Anderson can't do that. So I think he he needs to go to an environment now where he can just fuck around with a curveball grip or a slider grip and and not worry about it. Because if you're in the big leagues, you're not tinkering with that. You're you're trying to survive with your fastball change up and, and living and dying by it. So I think that's the difference here. And I think it's going to be good for him long term. Yeah. So Ian Anderson, he he only mixes in a sinker like one percent of the time. I'm talking like 23 total sinkers so far this year, but looking at what he's thrown. He's thrown 47% fastball, 34% changeup, 19% curveball. Wow. Batting average on each of those pitches. Fastball opponents were hitting 313 against it. Curveball opponents were hitting 295. Changeup, like you mentioned, that's the successful pitch. Opponents were hitting 210 against it. Um, slugging. Opponents were slugging 447 against his four seam fastball, 492 against his curveball, 341 against his changeup. He needs something to get better, whether it's finding something with the fastball or developing that curveball, like you're saying. I think it's the curveball. I think if he mixes those three and can throw any of those three in any count exactly where he wants to throw it, he turns into a very, very good major league pitcher again. And I think even if he finds it in spurts, he turns into a good major league pitcher again. Not very good, but good. Uh, This Ian Anderson... I'd be stunned if we saw it again in his major league career because he is too good for that to happen. I agree. I agree. I I think he's too good for, for this to be, you know, kind of the beginning of, of what is prolonged struggles. I think this is a proactive move by the Braves to also make sure that he can work on some things before the season's over, right? Like, would you rather him labor and labor and labor? And then you're in the postseason and you don't know whether you trust him or not. Like we know that this guy has it between the ears to pitch on the big stage. So yeah. if that's the case, let's get him as right as he can. Oh, so I've, I imagine he's gonna make four or five starts there. This was probably the plan. That's why they went out and got Jake Odorizzi. You know, yes. he can fill in and give you good innings in the meantime, but I promise you they'd rather throw Ian Anderson still in the postseason than Jake Odorizzi, because you know that this guy can rise to the big occasions. This is a guy that, you know, faced the Dodgers multiple times in the same series and was great both outings. Like this is somebody that has pitched on the biggest stage. I I think he'll be fine. Um, And and this was the right move. It stinks, but it's better to do it now than limp into the postseason. And you're like, do we even throw this guy? I mean, that's the worst thing on earth to deal with. It's uh, you, you talk about maybe leaving a guy off the roster. I think that's more mentally damaging than, Hey, go down to triple a for a little bit play around with shit. We still believe in you. We'll we'll see, uh, you know, in a month or less. Yes. I I'm with you. I'm curious how 
you, you, you just use the term mentally damaging. I'm curious how mentally damaging Fran Mil Reyes getting DFA'd could be. 26 year old with a career OPS of 793 has an OPS this year in 70 games of 603. He was one of the best power hitters in baseball since 2018 when he was a rookie in 2022. I mean, like this guy came up and in 2019 as a 23 year old in his first like true season, played 87 games with the Padres in 2018, hit 16 bombs in 87 games. But his first full season in 2019, 37 homers and 822 OPS. Now we're looking at a guy that had nine homers in 70 games, struck out 104 times, a 37% K rate, a 603 OPS. He just got DFA'd while Bobby Bradley got released. Um, Cleveland is doing something with their power bats. Um, I, I don't know if I agree with it, but it's hard to deny that Fran Mil Reyes is hitting 213 with a 254 OBP. He was not good enough to stay on the major league roster. I how does he bounce back from getting DFA'd? You know, it's it, and well, well specifically on the roster point, man. Like, wouldn't you rather just give those ABs to like Will Benson at this point? I would, and that's yeah. what they're gonna do. And 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 the problem for Fran Mill is that he put there's so much pressure on his bat, right? Like if if you're for Ed Mill Reyes, and you're not hitting, <laughs> you're you're not going to stick on a roster very long because you're you're a lug, and 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 that's the problem with the corner the corner mashers, and he can't really play the outfield, so it's it's first base DH really, right? I mean, I, that, it's not even first base, it's not even DH. first base, it's just DH, right? Like or really bad corner. Um, I, what's what's frustrating with Fran Mill is that. You know, usually you're just going to weather the storm. It's ups and downs, right? But ultimately, the ups are so high that you feel good about it. I just don't know if he's ever fully been right from this injury, man. He's always been a guy that makes, you know, questionable swing decisions. Like, he's super aggressive. He's going to chase more than average. But he's going to run into enough baseballs where he feels pretty good. And he's able to, you know, produce enough. I I wonder if because of the injury, he's a tick slower. He's cheating even more because his chase rates are even higher. Uh, and I think he was almost at the threshold of like, you can't go any higher than this or else you will not be able to have success no matter how talented you are. And I think he crossed over that threshold. He's swinging at everything. He doesn't look like he's seeing the ball. Um, and he just looks like a shell of himself. He's still extremely young. I think he needs to get right. And I think he will get right somewhere else. I really do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's going to be picked up. Like that's how that works. So when you're designated for assignment, you pass through waivers. And you have, I think it's a three-day buffer. Is it three or four? Um, so. I think it's three. You have a three-day buffer where other teams can pick you up on waivers. Um, if you are not picked up, you have the option of being outrighted to uh, that that AAA affiliate, to the minors. Um, he will not make it through waivers. No. Somebody's going to pick him up because of what Fran Mil Reyes can do. The guys that make it through are the ones that are organizational guys that, you know, like are good for the Cubs, are good for, you know, the Orioles, that type of thing. And, and they'll pass through, they'll head back to the AAA affiliate and then you can you grab them again. Um, but a guy like Fran Mil Reyes, a guy who has been a waiver claim, I want to say three times this year, maybe four times, Stu Fairchild. I just saw him in Louisville. This dude DFA'd waiver claim from Arizona to Seattle. DFA waiver claim from Seattle to San Francisco. DFA waiver claim from San Francisco to Cincinnati all this year. Um, like those types of guys. And Fran Mil Reyes is eons better than Stu Fairchild. And I, he's got eons more potential than Stu Fairchild. But that's the quality of player that when they get DFA'd, somebody's going to take you. Somebody's going to give you an opportunity. I think Fran Mil Reyes, if he does not go to minor league ball, he's going to get an opportunity to go to a team that can take a flyer on Fran Mil Reyes. And we'll see if he just figures it out somewhere that isn't Cleveland. Yeah, you might as well, right? Like if, if you're, let's say, almost any team out there, if you're the Nationals, why wouldn't you take a flyer? You know, or the Marlins, anybody, the Reds, because I saw Reds Twitter fall in love with the idea of Fran Because it's Reyes. found money. It's found money, right? <clears throat> if he stinks, okay, DFA him again. If he's good, now you've got him and you might be able to trade him later or he, he's 27. Maybe he's a piece for you. Like that's, that's the way it is. And, and I think there's teams that have 
really been able to make some money there uh, and, and really be able to uh, fortify their roster and find, especially with how much talent there is in today's game. Yeah. Uh, especially with teams and with 40 men crunch, like the, there's a 40 man crunch in Cleveland because of all their prospects. This was kind of a proactive move ahead of the rule five as well. I think to, to be able to do that, but it also gives them more roster flexibility as they're trying to make a push, even though they didn't acquire anybody. Um, you know, I, I, I think Fran is going to land somewhere. Obviously he's going to get claimed and um, you know, I, it'll be low pressure. He'll probably get more consistent ABs. And I think we can get going if he's right. But I mean, this is a dude with a very, very, very iffy approach. And you're just going to have to ride that wave with him uh, when you have a guy that's as aggressive as he is. But I think there's enough proven production here that you're going to get a pretty good player at some point, you know, in some way or another. So uh, the guy that is seemingly replacing him in the corner outfield right now is Will Benson, who you just mentioned. Will Benson in his first six games with the Guardians uh, is 0 for 11 with six strikeouts. Oh, Jesus. Now, th- take that with a grain of salt because I I think I keyed you in on what he was doing in Columbus earlier yeah. this year. I mean, he he has all the talent in the world. He was a former top 15 pick. And in 89 games with Columbus and AAA, this guy had a 426 OBP. He was leading all of the International League in OPS. He had 17 homers. He had 16 swiped bags. He walked 75 times in 89 games. Yeah, he's kind of the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I what Will Benson does, and he's still that massive human being that was taken out of high school. I mean, he looked like a 30-year-old like middle linebacker when he was taken in the oh, first round out of high school in the Atlanta area. I, I still, saw when he was like 15. When when he was 15 or 16, I was I thought we were playing a grown man. Uh it's and he's I mean that he was the one that stood out beyond everybody on yeah. that East Cobb Astros team that had all of the dudes. I was looking at this guy like you backed up a few extra steps in the infield when he was up. It just that's how it was. Like he's always been that guy. And, and he still is. And the difference is here is I think you have the same power potential. You have an extremely patient hitter in Will Benson. He knows that there's zone swing and swing and miss here, but he doesn't chase. He's he waits. He's a mistake hitter. He's going to wait and punish the pitches, but also he brings speed and, and above average defense and an 80 grade arm <laughs> from yeah. the outfield. So, yeah. you know, this just all things that you're not going to get from Fran Mills. So even if Benson is struggling offensively, at least he's not a lug. And I think that's the that's the biggest thing and what kind of pushed Cleveland to make that decision. Also, yeah. they'll have that 40-man crunch with Benson soon, and he would have surely been taken in the Rule 5 draft if they didn't protect him. I have a feeling that we're going to put together the best Rule 5 coverage out there just because mm-hmm. we're all kind of nuts like that. So uh, if you need your Rule 5 coverage, head over to Just Baseball. Yeah, the, the call-up will be all over it. I, I can't wait. Um, and that's going to be a great little uh, disruptor uh, during what will probably be some monotony in, in December. I know and maybe we'll have some moves at that point at the winter meetings. I don't even know what the winter meetings are anymore anyways. Um, everyone has a cell phone, so it, yeah, it we're good. defeats the purpose. Uh, but I, I will. this will be the most talented Rule 5 draft ever, and I can guarantee that this coming Rule 5 draft in December will ha- will feature multiple, I think, at least rookie of the year candidates. Like I think there's going to be a couple guys that will really break out. I, I mean, if, if we had the rule five, I like, I think there's going to be Steven Kwan type of guys that will be taken in the rule five. I think there'll be even better guys than that. Maybe even Will Benson type guys, guys will fall between the cracks, especially pitchers. Uh, yes. There's just so many teams that I don't know how they're going to make it all work. Uh, in terms of the roster spots there. So uh, that's going to be a really fun time. It it honestly kind of feels like the college situation right now in scholarships where everybody's scholarships were backed up that year by granting winter and spring athletes an extra year of eligibility and fall athletes too, that extra year of eligibility. So now colleges like have the most stacked roster they've ever had because they have like seventh year seniors on the team. Um, and, And that's what Major League Baseball has to deal with too because you had that rule five draft pushed back a year now you're combining two rule fives into one and it's going to be mega it's going to be insane and and i can't wait um i do want to talk about the comments that spencer strider made because spencer strider should win the national league rookie of the year he has been incredible this year and he has walked the walk now he does a lot of talking the talk um until now, he did a lot of walking the walk to back it up. 
Um, there was something that I shared on Twitter. He talked to our guy, friend of the program, Rod Friedman, and he quoted Casey Weathers. Casey Weathers, who's the pitching coach of the Louisville Bats right now, but Casey Weathers was um, I, one of the big first movers at driveline. And Casey Weathers, in his retirement speech, said something to the tune of, so many people are afraid to give it their all in something because they are afraid that if they do give it their all and they fall short, then they have to come to terms with failure. Um, and and it was this rah-rah thing that Strider really leaned into and wanted to, you know, a- acknowledge that, oh, I, I'm going to see how good I truly am. Um, and I am content with failure, knowing that I gave things my all. I will not make excuses for myself. That is pretty much exactly what he said. I will not make excuses for myself. And this, after he faced the Mets on Sunday. First one. I don't know. It helps when they're getting calls and 1-1 one, one counts turn into 2-1 counts mm-hmm. instead of 1-2 counts and stuff like that. When your BABIP is... 330, 340 as a team. It's tough to get quick innings and get quick outs. Next one, quote, a lot of weird hits. They seem to be having a lot of luck right now offensively. That's great. It's August. We'll see what things are like in October. Um, So if he hangs his hat on not making excuses, what was that? <laughs> yeah. Um, You know, I, th- that one, it's funny because at first – you know, my I didn't see the whole pressure, and my initial reaction was to to give him the benefit of the doubt. Now I, I responded to you and I said, "Hey, I, I think maybe when he's referencing Babbitt, because yes, batting average on balls in play being extremely high can point towards luck, but also really good hitters have a high Babbitt. So yeah, you know, like we we got to talk about it from that lens. And what do the what do the Mets do? They hit a lot of line drives and they run well. And line drives have the highest batting average on balls in play, obviously. Yeah. Yes. So I thought from that lens, he was just saying, oh, this is a team that sprays a lot of line drives and runs well. It's hard to get quick innings against them when maybe a few extra calls go their way. I thought that's what it was looking like. But then you followed up with more evidence that you just kind of went into there. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty lame. Look, he's a rookie. Um, he's supremely talented. He has not faced much adversity since really at all in his professional career, especially since he's really kind of made that next step and really has continued to get better and better. Um, you, you, you got to wear this one better, especially against New York, because it's already in the New York post. It's already everywhere else. Like New York media is going to run with this one. Fans are going to run with this one. You're just adding fuel to the fire here. And in, in regards to just disproving that theory that the Mets have been lucky again, this is a team that sprays line drives, makes a ton of contact and hits the ball low and hard. Uh, they, they're more of a throwback squad that is not going to get lucky when it comes to, to base hits. That's just not, that's one thing the Mets are not going to be. And if you look at expected batting average, it'll back it up. They're tied for third in major league baseball with the Dodgers and the twins and the Red Sox, ironically, which is pretty funny. Hmm. Um, but behind the blue Jays and the Phillies, right? The third and expected batting average. So if, if you're going to call them lucky, I, I don't really know if you can. Um, and, and that's the one thing that is, is a bit surprising to me is that, you know, he would kind of lean on that. Um, maybe he was frustrated. Uh, he got beat, but I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was super frustrated and, and I'm sure he already regrets saying it. I I almost, I almost sure I'm, I'm, I I would bet a couple of his teammates are like, yeah, come on, man. Like, even if you really do think that just, just wear it. And I think that's the opportunity for Charlie Morton to pull him aside and say, Hey man, listen. I've been through this. I said something like that when I was in my early 20s and I heard it and you won't do it again. Um, I think that is the opportunity for veteran leadership. Um, and I'm sure they've got it there, man. Like that's that's the they thing. They have too. to. I mean, Snit, Snit will probably even pull him aside. Like that's why I, I'm not too worried about it. But also what I do like about it is it adds some fuel to the fire. I, I'm This Braves-Mets rivalry, I think is going to really start to heat up down the stretch here. Yep. Um, and, and, and that's something that I, I'm just totally here for, especially because of the way that the giants really just fell off after challenging the Dodgers for one year. Um, yeah. and that was a really fun rivalry though, last year, right? Every time those teams played, we were watching, right? We well, were and how about Padres like, Dodgers too? Yeah. Like that, that too. became but, a fun but the rivalry. Padres and then the Padres kind of fell off a little bit. So now they're, now they're getting back there. We're going to talk about them getting swept, but like 
both those teams, we we thought we had two different teams that were going to hang in there with the Dodgers kind of faded. I think this Mets Braves rivalry could last for multiple years. Yes. And and that's what I'm really excited about. And I'm all I'm all the way here for stupid shit talk both ways because that's just gonna add fuel to it. And that makes our job easier. So I'm cool with it. <laughs> It makes our job way easier, and the Mets grinded out 79 pitches from Spencer Strider in two and two-thirds innings uh, when they had Jacob deGrom going on the other end. And this is the Spencer Strider that was on the heels of 13 punch-outs across, I want to say, six and two-thirds innings. Um, So this guy is the clear-cut front-runner for Rookie of the Year, and they turn him into a guy that has to make a high-leverage pitch every single pitch in the first inning in the second inning and in the third inning before he's lifted Degrom had 12 punch outs across five and two thirds um I like what the Mets did to Atlanta I got a text from Ryan Finkelstein after that and he said in your next power rankings you better have the Mets at number one um to that I say probably not have you seen what the Dodgers do however I understand that the Mets will be a top three team in the next power rankings because what they do against good competition, how they show up, and now they can run out Scherzer and DeGrom on back-to-back days feels like an end game when they do that. They grinded out Sandy the other day, man. I mean, they they put up four runs on Sandy. No one does that. They're the only team that's put up four runs on Sandy, and they've done it twice. Um, Excuse me, actually, Seattle did it too. So there's two teams that have done it. It's happened three times, and the Mets have done it twice. I, it, that just kind of tells you everything you need to know. They will grind out the best pitchers in the game, and it, that's that's the thing. Is even if even if a guy is pitching well against you five six innings, he limits you to one run. You're going to get him out of there. He's not going the distance against you, and that's that's the biggest thing that you got to do against aces. And Sandy only went five innings against the Mets. I mean, that's uncharacteristic for him this year. I, I think a lot of um and and the only sport, the only other sport that you really see it is in basketball where so much of the conversation and so much of the opinion formulated around teams is what they do off the field. Um, So basketball, you know, you can talk about the Lakers and what they do off the field is go to acquire Anthony Davis and later pay Russell Westbrook big money and now looking to, to flip Westbrook for another star, that type of thing. So I think a lot of people's opinion on NBA teams and major league teams are formulated by construction are formulated by Steve Cohen. So when you think the Mets, you think, Oh, Steve Cohen, ready to spend the big money. They can put together an all-star team. If you watch the Mets, they don't lay down. That's their thing. That's why they're one of the best teams in baseball. Mm. We've seen talented teams flounder because they lay down. The Mets do not lay down against anybody that's why they're in the position that they're in. The last, last thing I'll say on the Mets, because I totally agree with that. I mean, we, we've I've been at multiple games this year where they either pull off a crazy comeback or or start to come back and come up just short. And it's one of those losses where you're like, man, that stings, but we we will always have a shot. You know, um, I, I, I see a team here that really enjoys playing with each other. It, it, I've been to more Mets games than any other game. And, that's something I just started keying in on. I like just peering into the dugout like a weirdo and just watching the way everyone interacts with each other. But this can be backed up by you listen to the to the TV calls, right? You listen to you know what what Ron Darling and Keith Hernandez and Gary Cohen are saying. You listen to what everybody is talking about with that team. Buck Showalter is the perfect guy to lead it, and they all like each other. There's just something a little bit magical when Edwin Diaz comes in with the the amazing narco yeah, song. So dope. There's a vibe in this. There's just something different there. What this wasn't just a team spending a shit ton of money and saying we're gonna put together the All Star team. They were pretty strategic, right? I mean, I, Mark Canna is is not the the billion multi billion dollar you know signing that that you were would expect from you know Steve Cohen. These were smart, nuanced moves where I, you know, I think we got to give Billy Epler credit too. They yeah. made some, some, I was expecting them to just throw money at every big name, not sign Mark Canna for good value. And, you know, stick How about with Starling Jeff Marte. Starling Marte Starling was Mar- good value. Yeah. Good value as well. Sticking with Jeff McNeil. Like they've done a lot of things. And then even the trades rough Vogelback. like these are lower key moves. They didn't part with their big prospects and, you know, get caught up in it all. I love what they're doing, but I think the biggest thing is that these guys really do like each other. You can freaking see it. You can see the way they interact. You can see the way they celebrate and the way they are together. Of course, it's easier when you're winning, but I just get a sense that there is a large just level of cohesiveness with this unit. 
And and I think that we've only done it in spurts. I don't think that we've actually taken the time to give Edwin Diaz the flowers that he deserves so far this year. I'm not sure if you and Peter have done it on an episode, but not um, like we've we've touched on it, but I don't know if we've really talked about, you know, what this is one of I, I tweeted about it though. Like one of the best reliever seasons we've seen probably since his reliever season with the Mariners. Like yeah. it's it's up there. And, and I want to credit Billy Epler for sticking with Edwin Diaz because this was the guy that several times, more than once, would point up in the air signaling fly ball, and it was out of the ballpark by about 50 feet. Like, that's the Edwin Diaz that we saw where he was a flub along with Cano with that trade that involved Jared Kelnick. Um, but Edwin Diaz, what he has done to turn it around this season and put together a clear-cut National League reliever of the year – candidacy yeah, and like Cy Young I, votes he should get Cy Young votes um I mean what what he has done and and what the front office has done to hold out hope on him knowing that this was in there is a testament to the Mets and what they do yes Edwin Diaz is making about 15 million bucks as a closer this year but yes he was doing that last year and he stunk the Yankees are paying Araldis Chapman pretty much the same amount of money More. one of them is really good one of them's not really good the one that's really good he was in a positive environment. He's around a lot of guys that do their job effectively. And he turned into the superstar closer that we were expecting Edwin Diaz to be. I mean, he, there's a couple of numbers that will just really. Case per nine is the one that throws me the most. Oh, my God. So he's striking out half the batters he faces. Right. Um, but swinging strike percentage also like so average is about 11 to 12 percent. And that's just literally percentage of pitches swung at that results in strikes. His is 25.2. Yeah. He's more than double better than the league average. Uh, yeah. In zone whiff rate pitches in the zone and that are swung through. Average is about 16 to 17%, 34% for him. This guy has so much confidence right now. He can throw it in the strike zone. He knows you're not going to touch it. And I mean that's just absolutely spectacular. He's he's the best closer in baseball right now, and I don't think it's particularly close, especially with the struggles of Hater. To finish the game, two guys that he saw um, to finish the game yesterday: Matt Olson, Austin Riley. I just want to walk you through the pitch lock. I want because he throws slider and four seam fastball. That's it. That's two it. pitch guy. Don't need more than two pitches. Um, he struck out Olson and Riley to end the game. Matt Olson went slider at 92 for a called strike slider at 93 for a ball slider at 90 for a ball fastball at 101 for a strike fastball at 102 for a foul ball slider at 91 for a strikeout and then a three pitch punch out of Austin Riley slider at 92 for a swinging strike slider at 94 for a swinging strike fastball at 102 to finish the game. At, the, the only way you hit Diaz is if you sell out for a fastball and beat it. At one, how can you sell out for 102? It, you can, but you better get lucky, right? Like you better be. And here's the thing is you can't separate the fastball. He tunnels so well that you think it's a fastball and then boom, it's a 91 mile an hour slider. So that's why you get the ugliest swings you've ever seen against Edwin Diaz. So I, it, it's, it's awesome to watch. I, I, I really do enjoy. I wish we could watch him for more than one inning spurts because it's just so much fun to watch, but we got to Grom back and, and that's going to be pretty, pretty darn fun. As well. It's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah. yeah. Two things that I want to hit on before we say bye Cardinals sweep the Yankees Dodgers sweep the Padres. Yeah. Um, you lead me through this one. Cause I know that you you've got some good, you know, thoughts on like how to frame these two series. Yeah. So, I mean, like I, I, I was thinking about it from this lens and, and, it's interesting because what the Yankees are nine and are they nine and 16 over the last 25 games? If I'm not mistaken, I think that's I think it's right. So, it's something rough like that. Uh, the, the Padres went out and made a big move and, and haven't looked great, but they, they did run into to LA there. Wh which team are you more concerned about trend wise? I'm not asking which team are you more concerned about? Obviously the Yankees could really flounder and still win the division, but in terms of trend, right? Like which team are you thinking is going to go more into a losing streak or a tough stretch of the Yankees are in the midst of one. Um, I, I look at the Yankees and I'm like, who's going to break it for them right now on the mound? Like who's going to disrupt this, this rough streak. I still think the Yankees are, you know, the team to beat or, or right there. Uh, but 
this has been a rough stretch. They get beat by a Cardinals team that you know, they don't put out any any insane pitchers. You know, I we've talked we talked about that last episode. We did forget Miles Michaelis, uh, but they don't put out any guys that like you're really losing sleep over. The Yankees got to Adam Wainwright, but Frankie Montes was even worse. Um, their new acquisition. Which team are you more concerned about? Because the Padres have Fernando Tatis coming back within a week. Um, the Yankees already unveiled their their new addition. Again, I know the Yankees, no matter what, will finish in a much better position. But who is who is in in, in I guess on the way to maybe a rougher stretch over the next month? I, I think the Yankees might be. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's the Yankees. Um, I really do because y- you look at Friday's game. And they were outmatched by four innings of Dakota Hudson and four innings of Andre Pallante while Nestor Cortez walked four. And that is very unlike Nestor. Like, I think he has a bounce back start. But I also think the front half was a lot better than, you know, anybody was expecting Nestor to be. And we know Nestor is a really, really good pitcher. You can't rely on a low two ZRA from Nestor Cortez. That, that's not how that works. Um, you can't rely on a low two ERA from anybody. Like, you're looking at Garrett Cole. You can't rely on a sub three. He's in the mid threes right now. That's what you can expect. What you can expect from Garrett Cole is what you can expect from Aaron Nola. And I, I'm not trying to discredit Garrett Cole at all. I'm saying that you're you're happy when he puts together a 300 strikeout season. You're happy when he puts together that 2-5 ERA. But what you are expecting from Cole is 200 innings. You are expecting this guy to run out, give you six or seven innings every start. That's what the Phillies expect from Wheeler and Nola. That's what the Cardinals are still expecting from Wainwright. That's what you pay for. Everything else is gravy. Everything else is what you hope for. You can't assume a low two ERA from anybody. And then in a one nothing win for the Cardinals, you're beaten by your guy, Jordan Montgomery, who went five innings of two hit ball. I mean, they can use him right now, right? I love to see that. I loved to see it because Jordan Montgomery is a guy that should have a chip on his shoulder now. Like, oh, fuck yeah. you. You just dished me out for a guy that's currently on the injured list. I'm going to make you pay. He made them pay. That was an awesome start. And then Wainwright, he got roughed up, but you know what? So did Frankie Montas, and in the battle of the bullpens at the tail end, it was the Cardinals that won it in a high-scoring affair. Um, I think that this Padres team looks a lot different with much different energy when Fernando Tatis comes back from his rehab assignment. I think that the Yankees are in final form, um, and I just don't really think that the Yankees' final form is is good enough to to win the World Series. It's it's crazy because the offense is right. It is the best offense still in baseball, probably. If you look at a, a lot of metrics and a lot of things, and if you look at and just sheer production, of course, they have the best hitter right now in the game, and it's yeah. not really close. But pitching wise is is what what my concern really is, and and that's wild because they subtracted Jordan Montgomery. But let, let's talk about the last thirty days here, Jack. I have this queued up because everything you said, I agree with wholeheartedly, and um, <laughs> this is this is where it gets interesting. The last 30 days, which we know has been a rough stretch for them. Garrett Cole, 4.50 ERA, uh, obviously inflated from that disastrous start uh, against the Mariners, which just seemed like every at bat, someone was going yard. Even Jared Kelnick got in on the party. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think he's going to you subtract that one. The other four starts were good. He's punched out 46. He's walked four. Again, though, this is supposed to be your $300 million guy. Jameson Tyone. 5-1-8 ERA yep. over his last five starts. Jamont's gone. He was really struggling over his last four starts. Domingo Herman, 5.09 ERA over his last four starts. Clay Holmes, an 11.05 ERA over his last eight appearances. Aroldis Chapman, 4.82 ERA. Nestor Cortez has probably been the only guy that's been good for them, a 1.93 over his last four starts, and they're already trying to limit his innings. So he's a guy that, you, know, you don't know what it's going to look like. Luis Severino, hurt. This is a team that I think took their pitching for granted. And I liked the move in a vacuum. But the more I think about it, man, I don't know how you could feel good about trading Jamon. And don't forget, they also traded their closest to big league ready prospect arm in Ken Waldachuk. Yep. That's a guy that probably could have filled in for them at some point soon. Yeah. Um, this was a very aggressive, aggressive uh move for them to to trade Jamont. 
I think the way they attacked the deadline was aggressive. I think Montes is going to be better for them. He's going to be better than three innings, six runs. Yes. Uh, but they put a lot of stock into the Montes acquisition. And I think they put a lot of stock into what they have pitching wise. And here's the thing. They were at the goal line on a Marlins trade for Pablo Lopez. If they felt like they needed to you know, part with some significant assets to acquire Pablo Lopez and ultimately it falls through, how do you still kind of say, hey, we feel great about our pitching right now? If you yeah. almost made that move. Yeah. I, I know they could say, oh, that was just gravy. We're trying to put ourselves over the top. I don't know, man. I think they really needed Pablo. Um, and it's just crazy how quick things can change because we were talking about how impeccable this pitching staff was in the first half. But again, you, did you really believe Jamison Tyone was going to do this all year? Did you believe Clay Holmes was going to do this all year? Um, even Cortez, who, who was still doing it, but you know, can you rely on Nestor Cortez to do like, I love, well, he's a friend of the show. We love Nestor, but I mean, man, if that's the guy you're riding, you know, into the ground, that's almost not fair to Nestor. You can't rely on anybody to put together a low two ZRA. Again, it is only Ron Marinaccio. That's it. That's it. It's strictly Ron Marinaccio. There is no Bob Gibson anymore. Nobody's running out to his sub two ERA, like maybe DeGrom. But and DeGrom, they, they demoted Ron Marinaccio, by the way. I know. Uh, but like he is one of one. You cannot rely on somebody to be the best pitcher in baseball. That is not how baseball works. It's how basketball works. It's how football works. It's not how baseball works because this sport is built on failure. It is built on how few times you fail. And, you know, we, we constantly talk about the best hitters in baseball will get out seven out of 10 times, right? That is the niche that we grew up with. That is, that's the classic saying that we grew up with. I'm sure best hitters in baseball fail seven out of 10 times. The best pitchers in baseball still allow three runs per every nine innings. That's how baseball works. Yep. You have to be okay with that. And you cannot walk on eggshells with pitching. Here's the thing that separates Houston and New York pitching-wise, because they both felt like they had a gluttony of riches on the mound. Houston has Lance McCullers coming back. He's on a rehab assignment right now. Houston has six or seven starters that they can turn to. The Yankees had five. All five were awesome. So they decided to look at the postseason and say, we're plus one right now. Let's go get better elsewhere. Yep. Houston said, we've got like six or seven. We're plus two. We're willing to give up one. And they didn't even give up one. So that's the big separator. Well, here. All they gave up was Jake Odorizzi. That's it. Right? Like, Jake, I would way rather give up Jake Odorizzi than Jordan Montgomery. Right? Like, Absolutely. Like, Odorizzi was like a plug and play guy. Montgomery was an integral part of their rotation in a lot of ways and has been for the last few years. So, you know, it is it is surprising going to the Padres side before I, I do want to wrap up with Correa and then we can call oh, it yeah, yeah, an yeah. episode Um, the let's, let's, let's be fair here. The Padres have, have not looked great either. They get swept by the Dodgers. Uh, I just have more faith that someone's going to step up and, and break this streak again. The Yankees are going to finish much better than, than the Padres. That, that is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about who is maybe on their way after getting swept by you know, a, a team that is solid, obviously getting both teams got swept by good teams, but which could be in the midst of maybe a, a really rough stretch. I think the Padres can get out of it. Uh, but let's be honest here. Sean Manaya has been horrible over his last five starts, a 6.66 ERA. Joe Musgrove recently extended, not worried about him long-term, but how about right now? We're he had talking a bad about a start. Yeah. 17 earned runs though in 21 innings. Uh, that's a 7.29 ERA. Clevenger has been good. 390 ERA. You Darvish has been good, a three flat over his last five starts. They send Gore out of there. Blake Snell has been good. So that's the difference, right? We're talking about Clevenger with a 3-9 over his last five. Darvish with a three flat. Snell with a 305. Those guys are giving you still quality starts right now. And I'm I will bet a lot of money on Joe Musgrove bouncing back. Um, I, I just have more confidence in, in what they have rotationally right now. Um, and and I think you look at the the lineup. They're going to get a nice little plug in there. They already added Soto uh, and they're going to plug in Fernando Tatis, who should be back in mid August ish was the quote, which is literally in a week. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he already is on his rehab start, took a couple walks. Uh, he's going to be fine. He's going to be really good. And they're going to be scary. Uh, I'm not really worried about them. Uh, I think they're going to push and finish pretty strong. And uh, I mean, now they got Josh Hader shortening games for them too.
Yeah, I, it, the energy is coming. That That's just how that works. Like, Fernando Tatis, yes, is he Alex Rodriguez reincarnated? Absolutely. But he is also the most exciting player in baseball. We had a kid, um, we, we had a couple of guys, a, a friend of uh, Howard Kelman walk into the booth in, in Indianapolis um, on Friday night. And there was a, a seven or eight year old kid that was with him that was wearing a Fernando Tatis Jr. jersey and a Padres hat. This kid grew up in Indiana. Like he, it's an Indianapolis kid that is wearing See, a Fernando right. Tatis thing and has become a massive Padres fan. And they were the ones that told me that he was going to start a rehab on Saturday. Um, like it, it's, that's what Tatis does. So yes, he's an incredible baseball player with otherworldly talent, but he is also energy. And if you think that he invigorates a seven-year-old kid in Indianapolis going to an Indians game on a Friday night, he invigorates Josh Bell and Juan Soto. They're like, oh, wait till Tatis gets in this lineup. And then we're running out Machado, Tatis, Soto, Bell, Cronenworth. Like it keeps on going. This team is ridiculous and the energy is coming. It's that's what that's the thing. And the Yankees, you know, I don't know if, like, yeah, you're, you're amped about Montes, you're amped about a lot of the moves that they made, but Benny struggled. Like there's just, there's just a little bit of a, a heaviness to the Yanks right now. I, I think they're going to sort it out before the end of the season and they'll, they'll finish strong. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have the same conversation in the postseason of, oh, are the Yankees getting hot at the right time? So maybe it's a good time to get that lull out of the way, but it, it's been a rough stretch for some question. Do world series winners start Domingo Herman every fifth day? No. Hell no. Hell no. And that that's kind of the problem right now. Um, one last note on, on the Padres is they're going to replace what, I mean, who's going to lose a B's with the song Kim. Yeah. Right. And, and Kim's been good. I, I, I really have been surprised. 101 WRC plus great defense. He's a 2.3 F4 guy. I, I think, think they're going to find, find a way to keep Kim in the lineup in some ways. Maybe Grisham somehow loses some ABs. I'm interested to see how they shake it out. But we're talking about guys in the 100 to 110 WRC plus range that are going to be swapped out for a guy that's going to be in the 150 range almost right away. Yes. Uh, and that's that's the kind of you know upgrade you're about to get here. That's extremely exciting. So I, I think Kim functions best as a super utility guy. I think 100%. you can spot King at, at Kim at third, short, second, and he can play exceptional defense at any of those three spots. Um, I, I think we moved to the goalpost on Hassan Kim a little bit because obviously he was – very highly touted and he got signed to much larger money than a lot of career KBO guys get signed for. But I think we were expecting Kim to be an everyday shortstop or everyday third baseman or everyday second baseman. That's not how Ha Song Kim is. I think Ha Song Kim is one of the best third middle infielders in baseball. Yeah. No, and, and the, the glove is awesome. I, I love the way he plays too. There's just something about Ha Song Kim that's fun to me. But um, no, he's, he's going to settle in more into the role that he belongs in. But what I love is that he filled in really well, um, and you got to give you got to give Hassan Kim credit there because uh, he he really helped keep them afloat. And I think Padres fans are giving Hassan Kim credit too. I love Padres fans. I'm a big fan of Padres fans because they Most. get it. Most. Most just minus minus one guy close to us that we hire. Yeah. yeah Why did you do that? <laughs> He was one of the first guys we brought on. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> shout out Javi Reyes, the, the, the goat. Uh, he wrote actually a great piece about how um, – oh, I had to change the headline. This guy's this guy's killing me. At first it was, uh, the Padres didn't win the trade deadline. They made it their bitch. And then I was like, we can't publish that on our website. Um, so it, it was like they didn't win the deadline. They dominated it or something like that. But it's a great piece. Javi killed it as always. Uh, so check that out on JustBaseball.com. Last topic I want to talk about with you, Jack, is is Carlos Correa because yeah. the Twins are super interesting. The Twins look really good. Um, I, I I love that ball club. I think they've done a lot of things to encourage Carlos Correa to stay. Right. I think that's one side of this too. Right. Is that they have done everything that they probably promised him when they signed him to a three year, hundred five million dollar deal, which was we're going to make more moves. We're going to try to win now. And we're going to try to build sustainable success as a youngish core uh, that they also were able to add to with the acquisitions that we've broke down at the deadline. Here's the thing with Correa. He got the LeBron deal, right? Which is the, the three years, 105, two opt-outs. He can opt out for $35.1 million next year or this coming off season, or he could do it the year after that and hit the open market. All reports were in May that everybody was expecting 
Correa to opt out. Correa is not playing to the best of his ability right now. He's still playing well. He's still playing well. So 1.7 F4, 122 WRC plus, 265, 343, 433 slash line, 13 homers. It's good. It's not Carlos Correa, like you said before we recorded. So I I wonder what Correa is going to do here. Does he opt in for 35.1 and run it back like another contract year? Or does he still opt out and feel like he can make some big money on the open market? Remember, Dansby Swanson is probably the best shortstop besides Trey Turner. Trey Turner, yeah. Yeah, so you have Trey Turner, you have Dansby Swanson. It's still a less crowded market, I think. What say you here? You think it's a less crowded market? like Than last year? Because it was what? It was Correa, it was Baez, it was Seager. Seager, story. Story. Well, I was a second baseman, but... I yes. just, there was more $100 million guys last year. That's f- But that's four. This one's three. Demian was another middle infield. Oh, you know, you're forgetting Bogarts. Guy. Bogarts is going to be. Oh, yeah, Bogarts is going to be free. Yeah, I it's think it's, be kind of I think the, it's the same. same. It's same. this. And here's the thing about last year. Correa was the clear-cut headliner. So Correa was going to set the market. Um, but he waited, and it felt like Seager set the market. Um, and Correa didn't think he was going to get the Seager deal. Um, I don't think Correa can show people his 2022 season. And as soon as Trey Turner signs his big deal, say, I want that. I think people are going to laugh him out of the room versus last year when Seager signed his deal. And he said, I want more than that. People were going to say, oh yeah, you're right. You were a six and a half war guy last year. He's going to end this year probably with a two war, two and a half war. That's not good enough to warrant the Trey Turner deal. Um, I, I think if he were to get signed, it would probably be closer to Dansby Swanson than Trey Turner. And I think it would be in between the two. Um, but you got to think about what what have you done for me lately? That that was the thing that just came to my mind. And, and Correa, what he has done for the Twins lately is not Trey Turner money warranted. It is Dansby no. Swanson money warranted. Well, you know, what's interesting, too, is I pulled up AAV. And and to all the points that you just made, if he goes to the open market, maybe he gets a longer term deal, but he's not going to to exceed the average annual value. He is the highest paid player in major league or a shortstop, excuse me, yeah. in terms of AAV. So Seager got the long term deal, but he got thirty two point five per year. Correa is making thirty five point one. That's a million more than Lindor, who's making the second most in average annual value. So you can opt in which I, I don't know what Trey Turner's deal is going to look like. I don't know what Swanson's deal is going to look like. I would presume that this is going to be either number one or two in terms of AAV. So you can opt into the highest average annual value for another year, which should be your prime, right? He's going to be 28 this coming season and still have a chance to go sign that mega deal, right? You go into free agent as a 28 year old. And I think that's why Scott Boris did it this way. Okay. If it doesn't work, you get another deal with the highest average annual value for a shortstop and try again to try to have that monster year. You basically get three cracks at a yes, contract it's year. Three strikes and you're out. Yeah. And if you don't hit on, on all three of any of the three, then you're in trouble. I think I'm going to bet on Carlos Correa having a monster year in one of the three years in Minnesota. He's battled injuries this year, but that is a big question. That is part of the question with him. Uh, but He's opting in. I, I'm going to bet on him opting in. I think we're both we're both in agreement here. And those reports from May that he was probably going to opt out, which I believe was probably the sentiment then, which is stupid for yeah. that to even be like talked about at that yeah. point. Shit changes quick. I think he's opting in, and Twins fans should be happy about that. Maybe you can try to work out an extension with him. Probably not going to happen as a Scott Boris client, but. They're probably going to get another year of Carlos Correa, and it fits perfect with their timeline if they're still holding out that Royce Lewis can get healthy and be an effective player for them. It's not going to be next year with the ACL, probably yeah. not till the end of the year. So let's see if he opts in. I think he has a monster year next year. I still think he finishes strong this year. But good news for Twins fans. We we think they got another year of Correa. Yes, and something that that I heard that didn't even click for me was Jose Barrios loved his time in Minnesota. And what these guys do, um, you see it a lot in minor league baseball where a guy gets called up and another guy gets called up or one guy gets demoted, another guy gets demoted. They hand off housing. And at at the major league level, that is on crack. 
Jose Barrios is handing off the lavish lifestyle that he lived in Minnesota to his fellow countryman, Carlos Correa. So if Barrios was treated well, think about how well Carlos Correa is being treated right now. Oh. He might love it in Minnesota. Didn't they gave him a right? private jet. They gave him the whole show. He, I think he does love it. If he loves it, then he loves it. I would say yes to $35 million and love it again for another year and see if I can work out a $200 million deal. I'd say yes to the point one uh, in, in the 35. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you would have to sweeten the pot a little bit for me. I'm rich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I'm, I'm excited. I wanted to see another year of, of Correa in Minnesota, and I think we're going to get it. Yeah, I think we're going to get it too. Um, and, and listen, another year of watching Correa and Polanco up the gut with Luis Arise at first base. I'm so here for that, man. I'm a big fan of that. And, and a healthy Buxton up the middle too. I'm I'm here for it. Up the middle. Talking about center fielders up the middle. There we go. <laughs> Is that good or bad? Do we not like that? No, it's good. I remember you gave me shit for saying a saying a center fielder up the middle is uh is not what we talk about often. We were talking about the Rockies, right? You said yeah, Zach Veen up the middle I too. I do think it's kind of dumb, but I'm I'm kind of leaning on it now because I I just tired of saying center field all the time. Yeah, me too. You got to think about other ways to say shit. That well, that's broadcasting one hundred and one, right? And writing, honestly, like how many times can I say the same word? I don't want to say it that many times. Also, one last point: a J Rod card sold for two hundred seventy six thousand dollars, which is crazy. Um, Julio Rodriguez is Bowman Chrome Auto out of five sold for two hundred seventy six thousand dollars at Golden Auctions. I'm writing up a whole story on it, kind of just about you know how it compares to other top prospects or rookie card sales and whatever. My goodness, that's that's a lot of money for a rookie. Yeah, speaking of up the middle, um, but we, we were talking about it right before we hit record. If you were going to invest in one guy like that right now, who were you investing in? And I think the answer is a resounding Julio Rodriguez. Yeah. I mean, people would have said Wander before, clearly dealing with injury issues and some in inconsistencies from the left side of the plate. It's, it's, it's J-Rod, right? Like that's where your money's going right now if you're putting big money into – a player i mean jason dominguez went for 500k his one of one wow. uh, i'd r much rather have j rods one of five for 275 or 276 so uh, big big money still going in the card market and you know we're also covering that at just baseball.com so that's all i got we're covering everything man uh every link you need is in the episode description peter and i will be back to talk uh heat sheets and cold streaks tomorrow so the hottest team's the coldest teams, how much stock we can place in that, much like the uh, the Padres and Yankee conversation that we have right now. So talk to you guys then.